They're also unappreciated because we think of them as, as defective girls and they're uninspired. And that goes to that piece about risk and competition. You know, without a target, without a goal, without a score, without something to try for, boys just back out. Hi friends, it's Brittany Valadez for bravelydaily.com. All right, you guys are going to love today's chat. And I know I tell you that in every video, but because I love my guests that come on. So today we have Mark Hancock. Yes, he is the CEO of an organization called Trail Life USA. Now in this interview, we were we are talking, we were talking all things young boys and men. We're talking about the feminization of men, celebrating men for who they are, discipleship, why young boys need discipleship, what it looks like to be discipled. I mean, the list goes on. All right, let's just get into the interview. Well, hi, Mark. It's so nice to have you on the show today. And I have a question for you. I have many questions for you, actually. Tell us about Trail Life Ministries and what makes it different from Boy Scouts. Brittany, thank you. It's great to be on with you. You know, Trail Life USA is a Christ-centered, boy-focused character leadership and adventure organization for boys. We start kindergarten through 12th grade. If you're homeschooling, it's five years old to 17 years old. And we're formed in troops and patrols and we have handbooks and uniforms and a robust awards program, all that stuff that kind of looks like um, uh, Boy Scouts. And you can say, well, what's different? Well, those two things I said, we're Christ-centered and we're boy-focused. We're unapologetic Christian. We are an outdoor organization. We're not just having a Christian experience. We are at our core a Christian ministry that uses the outdoors to grow boys into godly men. For about 10 years ago, when the Boy Scouts started to lose their way, it was clear that there were a lot of churches and a lot of families that weren't going to be able uh, to con continue to participate there. And we've grown since then. We have almost 60,000 members. We're in all 50 states. About 1,200 churches right now uh, have uh, Trail Life USA troops. Wow, that is amazing. That Honestly, that's Awesome. And what I would say is obviously different. Yes, it's Christ centered. And something that's important in, of course, it, being a Christian is discipleship. Um, can you tell us what is discipleship and how is it different from accountability or is it different from accountability? And do they tend to go hand in hand? I, yeah. Wow. What an interesting question, because a lot of times you hear discipleship and mentorship interchanged, mm -hmm. discipleship and accountability. I don't know, I don't know if I've given a lot of thought to those two words together, but I know that a part of discipleship is accountability. If you're going to take on the role of showing someone how to live uh, a, a Christ-like life, then at some point you're going to you're going to turn back around and say, are you doing it? <laughs> and I think that's the accountability piece is saying, I'm, I'm holding you accountable uh, to what it is that you now know about, about the life that, that, that Christ is calling you to live. And so I think ac accountability is, is, is a definitely a key part of, uh, of discipleship and discipleship in, in particular, Christian discipleship, you know, is, is, is what we're about in Trail of USA, raising boys to become godly men. And uh, so we provide the structure for that and, and all the all the instruction and the training uh, for men to mentor, guide, disciple uh, boys and provide them with accountability. One of the ways that you see accountability lived out in trail life is awards. So if a boy is, is if he's pursuing the things being called to do, then he's going to have awards. If he doesn't have awards, that means he's not accountable to what it is that he's learning. So that that's how we uh, connect uh, discipleship and accountability. Oh, I love it. And, you know, a lot of times um, people will assume, or especially maybe moms in general or, or parents that, well, I want to, I'm raising my son and I'm going to teach him good manners and, you know, which are great. We obviously want discipline and manners, but I heard somewhere, I don't remember what, what I was listening to. Maybe it was a focus on the family podcast um, where they were talking about, you're not raising boys, you're raising men. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we will forget that when we look at a young child and we're talking to them in baby talk or trying to make sure they don't stub their toe, forgetting that that is a future man and a father one day and don't necessarily treat them like that. Um, where, what advice would you give to maybe parents who to, to kind of think in that mindset as they are raising their young sons, but not just looking at them as, you know, little kids to don't stub your toe or don't say, you know, the bad word, but... I'm raising someone's future husband, someone's future father. Yeah, no, that's that, that's that's a big thought there to understand the permanence. So, you know, if you've got two sons now that are 24 and 22 and being able to reflect on uh, that they're young men now and the things that I did in our lives that are, that are time together, of course, they're, they're moving out of the house. My youngest one gets married in, 
in June, and the oldest one's already married, so I'm at, right. about so to be cute. an empty nester. But I am reflecting on those sorts of things of what it, what it meant to be a father of a boy and to prepare him for adulthood. And it is an odd thing because, you know, at the point that a boy is a youth, that's when he's getting most time with his father. And, and, and it's at that point that he's got to learn to be a man, but he isn't a man at that time. And so it's really odd. It's like what I'm dealing with my sons. Now that they are men, they don't quite have the time with me that they used to. And it's odd that I'm teaching them to be a man when they're a boy. And when they're a man, I'm not so available to teach them how to be a man. So there's a lot that's got to be packed into that boyhood because generally as a father, you're not going to be around that much when he is a man. So you've got to pack all that man training when he's in the boy phase. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of an interesting thing, the way that God God has set it up to where that's, we can, you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm really raising up this great boy. Well, that's wonderful, but you're not going to be there when he is in the man phase as much. And so you've also got to be raising up a great man. And the way that you do that is by example. You know, the instruction for a boy is key. You know, open the door for a, for a woman. Don't talk that way to your mother. Work hard in school. Mow the lawn. This is how you change the oil in the car. Those kind of things are instructive. But the man part of it, you can't really instruct him in manhood because he's not a man. But you can show him what a man looks like. So that's more the observation point. So it's up to us as fathers and as godly men, even if we don't have sons, to live our lives as godly men in front of boys in a way that says, this is what a godly man looks like. And so where you're teaching boys to be good boys, you're showing boys how they can be good men. And that's why we surround boys in trail life with good godly men who, uh, who have uh, signed a statement of faith and statement of values, and they're just good men. Um, a lot of boys in a program don't have a dad in the program, but they've got a man that they can look up to. And that's important because, like I said, the manhood part is by observation. And so they're they're looking all the time, learning what what does a godly man look like? And uh, so that's the way we raise uh, that we, we turn boys into godly men is we show them godly men and we walk it out in front of them. You're right. And, you know, they say that men are visual and obviously showing people how to do things um, it makes a big difference. And a lot of times we are products of our environment. And of course, there is the spiritual aspect of that, of accountability and sin. And just because our parents did something doesn't mean that we have to do it ourselves. But we do learn a lot about a lot about life based on what we see. And so if you see a father, you know, who is abusing, you know, the wife, which is a little boy's mother, the boy could end up doing that to his own mom, or he could say, you know what? I saw that. I want to do the opposite of that. Um, but yeah, you do have people, everybody learns from what they see and what they're, they're surrounded with. So it's really good that you guys are stepping into that plate of um, where people don't have fathers and you're stepping up and saying, hey, you know, you may not have a father figure in your home, but that doesn't mean you have to have an environment of fatherlessness. Uh, we have our heavenly father, but then we also have this example over here of a godly man who can help mentor you and disciple you. Um, what are some, I guess, qualifications, the vetting process um, yeah. that you have for them? Like, what's the vetting process like? Yeah, it's pretty exhaustive. I mean, you just can't go to Trail of USA and join a troop. Um, you've got to come through the door, which is that local church. You know, our troops are not just groups that meet in the basement of a church. We are uh, an outreach of that local church. So we have what's uh, a position in every troop called a troop ministry liaison, and it's exactly that. He's the troop and he's the ministry liaison. He works between the troop and the church to make sure they're connected in a good way. And that person approves every adult member. And which means that they get personal reference. They have to come with personal references that people can say, I know this man to be a godly man. So it's not just a guy signing up and paying to be a member. Uh, he has to go through this process. And then, of course, once he's through that part where the local troop says, yes, we think you will be a good influence on the boys in our in our troop. Then the home office kicks in. That's we do criminal background check, child safety, youth protection training. Every year they're trained every year. Uh, about, about two to three hours of training, I'm sorry, every other year, two to three hours of training, child safety, youth protection. We have the gold standard in, in youth protection. All of our adults in the program wear a lanyard that identifies them as being a, an adult who's supposed to be there and supposed to be in, in, around those boys. So we do, we take take a lot of care uh, in preparing those adults. They also sign, as I said earlier, they sign a statement of faith. 
a statement of values. And the statement of values would talk about things like the definition of marriage, what a man and a woman are, and what a marriage looks like, one husband, one wife, the biblical uh, definitions of marriage. So they agree to live their lives in, a, in adherence to both the statement of faith and the statement of values. And those are the men who are living out in front of the boys. Now, the boys, of course, they don't have to go through the process. Any boy of any faith or no faith at all is welcome to join Trail of USA because we want those boys to be surrounded by godly men. We have so many boys in our program that don't have a dad. You know, one in four boys now in our culture doesn't have a father. I have a lot of those boys in our program and a lot of men who we call dad likes. They're in the program because they want to pour into the next generation. Some of them don't even have a son in the program, but it's important to them to pour into the next generation. Plus, they enjoy the brotherhood of the men who are going out and hanging out and doing these cool things in the outdoors. Uh, they enjoy that brotherhood, but they're also pouring into the next generation. We have so many single moms who are so thankful for Trail Life because they have some godly men for their son to spend time with on a regular basis um, and to give him that ideal of what it means to be a godly man. Just interrupting this interview to remind you guys to subscribe to this channel if you're not already. And of course, follow me on social media. I will put all of that in the description box below. Okay, back to the interview. Absolutely. And and I know women are so important. And But the thing is, we need men. Obviously, if you look at a lot of, like you said, there's so many studies out there that show the importance of men. And it shows in the life of their children when they when the children come from a fatherless home. And it's a lot harder for them to get through life the, the way they – it's just there's so many things. So I, I love what your organization is doing. And can you give us some examples or maybe some tips for maybe there's some men that are watching that are saying, you know, I want to disciple someone else. Um, or maybe they're just fathers that want to start discipling their children. What practical tips could you give them to say, OK, this is what you would do when you're talking to a young boy or this is something you can do action wise? What advice would you give to them? And then the second part of my question would be, what advice would you give to young boys who are wanting to be discipled? It's beautiful. I, I talk about that all the time because I'm always talking to men. I speak at a lot of men's events, homeschool uh -huh. conventions and, and things. And of course, the men in our organization always talk with them about the way to connect better with boys. And there are some there are some real there are some real keys to, to understanding boys. You know, boys are not girls. <laughs> they're not defective girls. They're not they're in our culture today. Unfortunately, they're twice as likely to be in special education, three times more likely to have ADHD. They've fallen behind girls in every single academic category. Uh, boys are just just really struggling in our culture today that's trying to make them like girls or try to treat, treat them like they are. But they're very different. We have a couple of books right now. They're free downloads, actually, at trailifeusa.com. One is called Let Boys Be Boys, and it answers that question that you're saying. What's the difference between boys and girls, and, and how, how, do, how do I encourage uh, boys? And then another book called Raising Godly Boys, where we talk about the proven process for turning boys into godly men. So I'd steer your people to those two free downloads at trailoffusa.com, Let Boys Be Boys and Raising Godly Boys. Yeah, it just, uh, you know, the Let Boys Be Boys book talks about the, the physical, emotional, developmental differences between boys and girls. Every legitimate science, science points to the differences between boys and girls. And our culture is trying to treat them as if they're saying they just aren't physically different, biologically, chemistry, I, everything's de developmentally. Boys' brains develop more slowly than girls. They 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 uh, develop emotionally more slowly than girls. They're just not they're not girls, and uh, we so we have to we have to account for that. Um, so that's one of the things we talk about. You got to recognize the difference between boys and girls and respect that that's the way it is. We can't. It's like in our culture today, we're making boys feel like there's some kind of social disease that needs to be eradicated or something because they can't fit in that sit still, be quiet, pay attention um, environment that we put them in constantly. Because and that leads to the next thing. Boys need to move in order to learn. They just, uh, Harvard scientists tell us if a boy's not moving, his brain is not engaged. And so that boy who's fidgeting in the classroom or mom, if you're working at home and he just can't sit still, that's because he's telling, if you want me present, you got to take this motion, whatever it is, my knee, knee bouncing, whatever it is, I got to be moving. That's just, that's just the way that he keeps his brain on. If you want his brain, you got to take that motion. It's not the same for girls. Their eyes are different. Their ears are different. Their brains are different. So many differences between boys and girls. Boys need to be moving. They need motion. That's why that sit still, be quiet, pay attention. It's just so hard for them. And also risk and competition is a big deal. You know, boys uh, tend to not uh, be as engaged if there isn't something at stake. 
they turn everything into a competition. You got two boys, little boys going to the water fountain. You know, you're when they ask for permission, when you say yes, you're really firing a starting pistol. I mean, because it's a race. Boys just turn things into a race, into a competition. And in our culture today, when we're not keeping score or giving participation trophies, all these things, what we're saying to boys is that you don't quite fit here. We don't want that kind of competitive thing. Just go along and just sit still, be quiet, pay attention. Now, they're going to turn it into a, a competition. And that's what gives us winning and focused men. Those are the guys who will get off the boats and storm the beaches of Normandy to free the world of tyranny or will get on a top of a rocket ship and be blasted somewhere or on a ship to go across an uncharted ocean. I mean, they'll do these things because they they value risk and they value competition. They will give their life for something that they find important. And in our culture today, we're discounting that, calling it toxic or whatever. And it's just really, it's really tragic for boys. So we have to pay attention to these things. Boys are, they're unguided. I mean, we, there's one in four doesn't have a father in the household. 76% of public school teachers are female. 80 something percent of Sunday school teachers are female. Girls have these tremendous role models all over the place. A single mom as a role model, is an, she's doing an amazing job. That boy in that household, he doesn't have somebody like that. He's wondering what does a strong man look like? And then he goes to school and there's a woman at the front of this of the classroom. So what does a strong man look what a strong man look like? Then he goes to Sunday school and there's a woman at the front of the classroom. What does a strong man look like? He's wondering all the time. We don't give him these good examples. So we have to guide guide those boys with good strong male examples. They're also ungrounded. You know, seventy six percent of Americans no longer believe that Bible that the Bible is a source of moral authority or that God is a source of moral authority. That's tragic. So boys are being raised in a culture where anything goes and, and they're ungrounded. They don't have a solid thing to stand on. How can you teach boys about good and bad uh, when you have no foundation for goodness or, uh, or when we, dis we discount sin as, as something that's bad? When you take those things away, the boys lose their foundation. That's why they're just confused and kind of don't know where to go. They're also unappreciated because we think of them as as defective girls and they're uninspired. And that goes to that piece about risk and competition. You know, without a target, without a goal, without a score, without something to try for, boys just back out. That's why they're so involved in video games. Video games give risk and competition, keep score. There's levels. It's really clear. There's a hierarchy. They know exactly what it is that they need to do. They can fail and then try harder and succeed. It's a great environment. That's, that makes sense. That world makes sense. And then we criticize them for playing too many video games. So all the all the the secrets of boyhood are not that hard to discover. And but we we just need to respect those things. And when we when we do, when we recognize what boys have that's different than girls, we can build winning and focused men and get back to that that generation that uh, that, that that believes in itself and can do great things. Absolutely. And you said a key word there. You said respect. So we often hear um, others. I can go into this topic forever, but I, I do believe that men, they see love through respect and women obviously feel loved through affection and in love. Now, with men needing respect, we often think of, OK, we've heard that in the church when it comes to relationships, men and respect. But have have we actually thought about it for young boys? And I've heard about that before, again, probably through a Focus on the Family podcast about the need for, for boys to have respect too. Um, what advice would you give to mothers to help teach them to respect their sons or, or even fathers? And I guess in general, do boys need respect starting at a young age or is it just the men? Yeah, no, boys, boys do. That's when it starts. That's when they learn the lesson of, of do they fit here? And when they walk into a classroom that's built for girls and they walk into a church sanctuary that's built for girls and everywhere they go, it's just built for girls, sit still, be quiet, pay attention. They learn to believe that they don't, that they don't fit. And they spend the rest of their lives feeling like they don't quite fit in. That's why men are not as active in church as they used to. They're kind of backing out of these kind of things and sort of disappearing this whole failure, lock, failure to launch because they don't know where they fit. So we've got to find that place for them. And it starts when they're young. So we don't want them to check out and say, I just don't fit on this planet. Um, yeah. we, want to, we want to engage them in that place. And one thing that we, that we know about boys is, is that, that they, they would rather be praised than punished, but they would rather be punished than ignored. 
And if we're not paying attention to boys, if we're not really, you know, a lot of times what we'll say is, oh, well, he's acting out because he just wants attention. Well, what's wrong with attention? Why is attention such a bad thing? You know, if he was emaciated, if he was starving and weak, we, we wouldn't just say, oh, well, he just wants food. You know, we would do something about it. And with boys, a lot of times the way we want to treat him is, oh, he just wants attention, so ignore him. That's, there's nothing wrong with attention. He wants somebody, he wants to be seen, to be known, to understood. He is this, he's this creature that wants to be, respect is, is the, the strongest piece of that, but just, just, to, just simply see him, know him, and understand uh, the way that he's wired. And that's, and that's sufficient for a boy. That helps him feel well fed, like, like he fits there. So we have to do a better job of seeing, knowing, and understanding them and, and not, not ignoring them or not discounting them or setting them in a corner or out of sight somewhere where they're not bothering us. Everywhere they go, they already feel like they don't fit. So we got to do a better job of letting them know they fit. Which brings me to the next point is boys have to be welcomed into the company of men. It's not an automatic thing. They have to be men, you know, our cultures used to have those rites of passage where a boy knew that he had to do this in order to be a part of the next group. We've lost that. And that's why we have a lot of grown up boys in our culture. They've never been welcomed into the company of men to say, you're a man now. This is, you fit here. You belong here. You're one of us. And we've got to restore that for our boys. And that has to do with respect. I'm um, just paying attention to where they are. Another way to show respect for boys is boys aren't interested in what you have to say until you've heard what they have to say. They really have, they have a lot to say, but uh, the, the lectures and the number of words, you know, you talk about moms, moms have a tendency to use a lot more words than boys are comfortable with. They've checked out a long time ago and our lecture is still going on. We've got to, sh we've got to shorten messages to boys so that they stay engaged. They're not sitting there thinking, oh, Maybe if I stay here for another 10 minutes, mom will say something that will fix my issue for forever. No, that's not what he's thinking. He's thinking, I can't believe she's still talking. <laughs> you know. So we have to respect boys in that they don't have uh, the, 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 the patience, the processing, the, the same, same ability to stay connected for that long, that long a period of time. So we have to be careful with the way that we speak with them. They don't do well with the lecture. They have to be heard before they'll really hear. And even with men talking with boys, um, that, that lecture kind of thing, until a boy is talked out, he's really not ready to listen. I've got two boys. Uh, one of them uh, was, uh, was less quiet and the other one woke up talking. I mean, he, he just talked all day, talked. He would fall asleep just still talking. He had actually trained himself, Brittany, this is crazy, he actually trained himself to speak on the inhale because he didn't want to leave a break where somebody could interrupt him. So he would talk like this on the inhale, and then he would talk on the out, he'd talk like this, and talk like that, just breathe, you know, because he didn't want to stop and take a breath. <clears throat> that hurts my throat. But he trained himself in that. So some boys, you just got to listen to them. And But somewhere along the line, they get kind of shut down, and if we don't keep them up and continue to listen to them, we lose them. They have wonderful things to say. Some are a little bit crazy. Their thinking is a little bit, a little bit odd. Um, they think things like, you know, there's, uh, there isn't a tree that shouldn't be climbed. They have these certain thoughts that are different than, than girls. And we have to be present with them and hear what it is that they have to say. Then they'll be ready to hear what we have to say. You know, I think it takes a little bit of dying to self too for the women to understand the mind of a man or a male in general, boy or a man, to say, you know, maybe because women, women, like you said, women and men are wired differently. And a lot of times both sexes will think, well, I'm going to talk to her like this because this is how I perceive and how I hear things. And she's going to say, I'm going to talk to him like this because this is how I do it with my friends. This is how I hear it. And it's like, no, you are looking at a different person created in the image of God. If you think about it, from the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he created male and female. He created two very different beings that when put together, they make something whole. So usually if you're attracted to the opposite sex, it's the opposite of you. They're not going to be the same as you. In fact, that's why you're attracted to them, because they're the opposite. 
Now, it does make working with them sometimes difficult, whether it means you're in a relationship or it's a mother and son or a friend, uh, because they are different. But instead of complaining about the differences, it's saying, wait, you have things that I lack. I'm going to appreciate where you fill in the gaps. And that's, you know, both sexes telling each other that. And I think when we start appreciating the differences of other people, that's when we can start making progress and really making change. But it begins with dying to ourselves and realizing we may not have all the answers, all the right answers. Our way is not always the right way. And sometimes, wait, what we're thinking about them is completely different than what is really going on in their head. I mean, I could go, I could go on. <laughs> but no, yeah, I, but I love is, is- isn't that beautiful that we're created that way? And that's not a value statement. You know, when you say somebody's different from you, you're not, it's not a value statement. It's just recognizing that men and women are different and yeah. boys and girls are different and what incredible strengths they each have. And if we can figure out how to enter their worlds and give them what it is that they need to grow up and be mature and, and confident and, and godly, um, then we should be doing that. And you're right. When you, when um, we'll talk about men and women specifically, or like a mother and son, when the the male is being heard or when the boy is being heard, then he will listen. But yeah. in order for someone to hear you, you have to speak their language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, I, if I'm going to go to France and the person only speaks French, I can scream at them 5,000 English words and they're not going to hear anything I say. Yeah. But if I learn French and I speak yeah. to them in French, they're yeah. going to hear everything I say. So I do, um, I, w- I was thinking, what about, for, okay, now a lot of times we, we were talking about earlier about fatherless homes, and there are dads out there who will abandon the family when the children are very young, so that children ra- are raised without a father, or there will, will be a father present in the home, but he is just so busy with work, he's not paying attention to the kids. Um, so we will talk about them in a minute, but what about the father that is present, and he's actually really kind and really nice? And sometimes his son takes advantage of that. Um, what advice or encouragement would you give to that father? Because he's trying to reach his son, but his son um, maybe takes advantage of his father's you know, kindness and there's really no boundaries. And so the son is acting out or he's just getting involved in a lot of things that he shouldn't because, you know, dad is really not putting his foot down. Yeah, well, you're right. A, a, a passive dad is can be just as dangerous as one who's overly active Mm -hmm. and too controlling and too and too and too present um and so yeah no that's the we really have to find we really have to find that place where we're not frustrating our sons either by being too domineering over them or by giving them too much freedom like i said earlier boys are unguided they like direction they like uh they like to be able to press up against something that isn't going to move. They'll challenge that thing, but they challenge it because they want it to stand. They want to know that it's going to, it's not going to move. I remember, Doctor, you talk about focus on the family. I'm going way back when Dr. Dob- when Dr. Dobson was on focus. And I remember telling the story about a uh, child care center. And they had a, in the back, they would open up the doors and the kids would play in a playground, a fenced in playground. He says, and they did an experiment. They removed the fence. When they removed the fence, the kids all clustered up by the building. They they couldn't go. They they didn't want to go out because they didn't know where the boundaries were. And they put the boundaries back, and the kids pushed against the fence, climbed on the fence, beat against the fence, everything. And that's that's just a really good uh, demonstration of how uh, kids and boys in particular they want to know where they stand. They like hierarchy. They like structure. That's why like, they like to keep score. They want to know who won and who lost. They, they they like to know where they stand. That gives them confidence. That gives them security. And it's the same way in, in, in a dad and what they need from that, that male leader in their home is somebody who's going to s- set the boundaries, set the lines and say, okay, son, here's, here's, the, here's the home that we live in. Here's the rules that we have. And as long as we stay in, be- in between those lines, you're going to be okay. Um, and 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 then be be solid in, and uh, and 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 enforcing those those rules without being overpowering, and that's just really the balance. How big do you make that area for for a boy to roam in? You know, in terms of the rules, and then when he does break the rules, how are you going to respond? How how strongly are you pushing against those? You can be too weak and take the fence away completely, and then they're just saying as they're not being a rule at all, or you can be so. 
uh, so strict in the, the application of the rule that there's no love and that there's no grace and there's no understanding or room for that boy to explore anymore. And either one of those extremes uh, can be harmful for a boy. But if they're done, if, if it's done correctly, you're raising good, confident, godly young men. You address even those who are from the fatherless homes, which is where your organization, your ministry comes in and, and helps those who actually don't have a father present. And you said what you said was key about balance. You don't want to be too rough to where they're not feeling loved. You, do, you don't want to feel too free that they're not feeling like they're a structure. And you know what? I think that in general, that is um, for both women and men and boys and girls, uh, the idea of boundaries, it helps us mature. I mean, even God gives us boundaries throughout, the, throughout his word. And it helps it helps us to know that there's a safety net, that if we stay within this, yes, as our sinful nature is trying to push past those boundaries, knowing that there is boundaries, which is foundational truth that doesn't change, that's what helps us, I believe, find our way back to God. So I think that I would say in past generations, it's been said that a lot of times men were kind of told to shut up and act like men, not express their feelings. And a lot of times men can wall up and, you know, obviously talking about young boys as well. Um, and I think that now we see a shift of we're trying to get men and boys to open up, share their feelings and emotions. And yes, that's a good thing. But do you see that the shift has gone too far to one side and to the point where maybe People like young men, young and boys are opening up and they're confessing, but there's no repentance if it's in sin or there's no change because, well, I'm going to open and express my feelings and I'm going to tell you what's going on, but um, I am not having any structure about how to move forward, you know, in, in Christ. And I say this because I was listening to a podcast and the, the, the host was talking about how when he was in college that um, him and his friends, they would meet together like at a Bible study and they would all talk about their you know, addiction to porn. And he goes, every week we were sharing about our addiction to porn. Every week we were sharing. And he goes, and then one day I was like, you guys, we keep sharing, but are we doing anything to change it? And I was like, hmm, I didn't think about that because a lot of times we we go from, well, men, you know, they were told not to say anything years ago and they were holding it in, which is, is bad for mental health and then physical health in general. And now everybody's sharing and and, and is that bad? Where do we find the balance of men need to open up and share because it's not healthy to hold everything in because it's saying, I, I, I know it all and there's pride, but then we're sharing too much that we just become so emotional, but yet there's no change. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And we are seeing that where men are kind of being drawn into this, you got to be emotional and, and open and more of a, a softer man. There's some truth in that in order to connect mm -hmm. better with our wives or with our kids. We do have to be somewhat present with them but you're right it can be taken to an extreme and we lose that ability to, to be to be the person who also holds the line um to be the person who stands up as the protector and the and the warrior um you know because you can't send a guy to battle who's just going to go out there and be you know emotionally connected with everything he's shooting at you know he has to have the sense of i've got duty and i've got a mission and it's and it's not about it's not about that it really takes all that strength um, and, uh, you know, in, or in order to create a society that's functional. Um, and if we take away too much from that, if we make our men too emotional, um, then we just have, we have all, all women who are beautiful and wonderful. Um, but, but there is that beautiful part that, that women play in bringing that softness and that emotional connection. You watch two women in a coffee shop, they're, they're talking to each other face to face, talking at the same time, totally connected, totally engaged on the same wavelength. And two guys, you put us face to face, like we don't know what to do, but you put us side by side out on a trail or around a fire or something like that, or turning a wrench, anything you put us side by side, that's how we connect. It's just a different way to do it. And to try to force that uh, female type of connection onto men is, is you, we're just not, we're just not gonna produce good, strong, you know, godly men. We're not going to produce a, a complimentary man. We're going to tr produce an, a different type of woman. Uh, and uh, so that's so I, I hear what it is that you're saying. There is there's totally uh, the warrior mentality and the protector and all that. That's essential, man. But you can't be only that. You've got to have some ability 
some emotional intelligence and ability to connect, but you can't go so far over that you lose touch uh, with it, with the, the strength that makes you unique. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, it's an element, well, it's one of the fruits of the spirit, self-control, where mm -hmm. for men, they can wall off and be um, too hard sometimes. And then women, we can be too emotional. And it's saying, am I going to rein in? Am I going to have that self-control that the Holy Spirit gives to maybe not take everything so emotional coming from a woman's side? And then for men, not taking everything so hard and finding that balance. And I think when we do that for by first submitting to God, he starts changing our, our will and our desires. And then he also starts changing how we see each other. So it doesn't become an us versus them, but a, we're in this together, just like Christ made us. Yeah. Um, so ah, I just love where your, your ministry, your organization kind of fills in the gaps for this. And I'm so glad we were, were able to have this conversation because I do think there are a lot of women that have good intentions. I mean, I myself, I like to, to go and offer advice and help. I, I love to do that. But I've seen the need for there's needs that I cannot meet that are that young little boys or, or young men, they have to go to older men. And the same with women. We have to go to discipleship from, from other women. So um, I'm so grateful for what you guys are doing, like truly, truly grateful because I have seen myself it churches or people in churches who haven't been discipled by people of their same gender or and, and older. There's um, a lack of a desire to follow Christ. There's an immaturity, like you said, a failure to launch. And then there's also no respect for authority. Um, but when they're sitting with someone else who is, you know, older than them and they're learning from them, they start seeing the world differently. They start having respect. Um, so can you tell us um, for maybe somebody who is watching this and wants to get involved with their church um, to get maybe it's a mother that wants to send their son to this organization or a father or there's a father that wants to be like a, a mentor. How can yeah. they find yeah, at traillifeusa.com, trail life, two L's in the middle. Uh, there's a tab there that says, I think it says get connected. If you click on that, you can start it. You can find a troop, which gives you the map of the United States. You can put in a zip code and it'll show you the troops that are nearby. You can click on them and reach out to those troops and say, hey, when do you meet? Can I come be a part? Uh, and if you don't have a troop in your area, you can start a troop. And we do that through churches and it takes five adults. And typically what happens is a man will go to that pastor and say, pastor, we got to do something for boys. And uh, they'll, they'll put together a group, a group of adults who uh, will start that troop. And, and then you're off and running. We do all the training. We have a lot of online training, in-person in training, um, handbooks, guidebooks, everything people need to be successful, successful in that. Uh, we just got through doing a, a thriving troop survey where we look, deep at what's been happening all years in, in, all year in a survey, we're finding that churches are growing, churches that have Trail Life USA troops, that a number of those adults, uh, they're joining that local church. Because you can ask a boy to come to church to Sunday school for forever, and he may or may not go. But if you ask me to whitewater rafting or zip lining or, or going camping or hiking or backpacking, that boy's going to show up. And then what we're seeing happen over and over again, Brittany, that's so beautiful, is that that unchurched boy joins the troop. And then that unchurched family joins the church. And so we're seeing a number of people who are coming for trail life and they end up being uh, members of that, that local church. So we encourage pastors and leaders, um, but you don't have to be a pastor to start a troop. You just have to go in and meet with your pastor and say, hey, we need to have this here. Boys are in trouble. Somebody's got to do, not just the boys in our church, boys in our community are in trouble and we need somebody who's paying attention to them. There's a girls group called American Heritage Girls, which is our girl counterpart. They've been around about 20 years longer than we have, but we're great friends with them. So we know they got the girls covered. So that's good. They're okay. The girls are just fine. Um, but we're focused on the boys because they're so desperate. You know, it takes godly men to raise godly men. They're just not going to appear out of nowhere. And um, so we're putting these godly men with those boys. You can also find an opportunity to volunteer. If you don't have a son, find a troop nearby and say, hey, I'm here to help. How can I help the next generation? And I'm telling you, men, if you're listening, it's the best brotherhood you'll ever have. I always say it all the time. Trail men are the best men I know. And they're together, uh, enjoying the outdoors together with this group of boys. The boys bed down and the dads and the, and the men sit around the fire and they talk about 
their issues. You know, they can't do it over a cup of coffee face to face, but they can do it around a fire. And so men are having these wonderful, strong men have trouble making friends today, uh, but they're finding their friendships. They're finding their band of brothers in Trail F USA. So I'd encourage men to, to come be a part two. Those boys need you. Oh, absolutely. And I think that if we look to the word, you start realizing how God created women as the helper. You start wanting to, um, you start appreciating that role that it's not less than, but yeah, you start looking at your personality, the things that you do. And you're like, I actually do tend to help more in my role because that's how God created you. And I think that when we develop men who are called to be leaders, because that's how God designed them. And he created them first in creation. They're leading a family. But when we don't appreciate the qualities that men have that are different than women, and we're trying to make them like women, they will have that, like you said, failure to launch. There's no desire to step up. There's no desire to lead. There's no desire to do anything because sometimes the women are trying to overtake the men. Or you have, I think sometimes I feel like it seeps into the church with women pastors. Women, you can help there's so many ways, but the leadership role first in, in Timothy, it tells us the qualifications of, of a pastor and it's the husband of one wife who can lead his family well. So I think that by training them very young, we may be able to, you know, train a generation of young pastors, yeah. leaders, whatever through, through your through you guys organization. So I'm so grateful that we have this chance to talk like you downloaded so much wisdom on here. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I really uh, appreciate being a part of what it is that you're doing. Thanks for, thanks for stepping out and sharing goodness with people. Friends, what did you guys think about my chat with Mark? I enjoyed every single one of it. And if you guys are watching this and you're girls, I want you to be encouraged. Remember, men are different from us. They are not the same. They don't think the same way. They are very different. And when we understand that, we can reach them better. Men, Women are different from you. They're not the same. We think different. We act different. And when you understand that, you can reach us better. So the point is, friends, that we celebrate each other's differences, how God designed us, designed us, and we appreciate each other. Because when we come together, it's unity in the body, and we can help each other where each other needs help, and we can edify each other where each other needs edification. Edifying. All right. If you guys like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with all your friends, and of course, don't forget to follow me on social media. I'll put all of that in the description box below. Until next time, I'm Brittany Valadez for BraveTheDaily.com. God bless and I'll see you in the next one.